Okay, this video is talking about polynomials that are not going to be centered at zero because sometimes we're going to estimate values that are a little too far from zero to use x equals zero as a convenient point. So we're going to look at this first example where I'm giving you derivatives just like I did in the last problem for a cubic function f such that and so it looks like this one is going to be centered around one. So we're not finding f of zero, f prime of zero, f double prime of zero, but we're finding f of one, f prime of one, and so on. So if we write the cubic function for this, f of x will look like, and then we're centering it at one. So what I'm just going to do is just shift the cubic function right one unit. So the function would look like this, d plus c times x minus one plus b times x minus one squared and then a times x minus 1 cubed. All right, if we find that f of 1 is equal to 0, then we know that 0 is equal to d plus c times 1 minus 1 plus b times 1 minus 1 squared. And then, oops, I forgot the a on this. I'm sure you noticed that, a times 1 minus 1 cubed. 1 minus 1's all become 0, so now I've found that d is equal to 0. d is equal to f of 1, which is equal to 0. All right, let's look at f prime. f prime of 1 in this case is equal to 4. So if I find the derivative of f of x, f prime of x, then d would be gone. This would be 1 times c. And then the derivative of x minus 1 is just 1. Plus, if I use x minus 1 squared, I'm going to think about chain rule. So I'm going to bring the 2 out in front of the b. So this is 2 times b. And then x minus 1 stays the same. And then the derivative of the inner function is just 1. So this is 2 times b times x minus 1. And then I'm going to do the same thing for this. 3 times a times x minus 1 squared. If I replace x with 1, then I'm going to say that 4 is equal to 1 times c, all of the rest becomes 0. So c is equal to f prime of 1, which was 4, divided by 1, starting to follow the same pattern that we had before. Okay, if I look at the second derivative, the second derivative of 1 is 3 finding f double prime of x of c, that's 0. Then I've got 2 times 1 times b plus 3 times 2 times a. And I think you're starting to see that even though this is centered at 1, we're still following the same pattern that we did with a Maclaurin polynomial, with a polynomial that's centered at 0. So, but the difference is we're finding the derivative at the point, at the center point. So the, finding the derivative at 1 in this case. All right, so f double prime of 1, I should have looked before I went away, was 3. So let's see, we've got 3. And if I replace x with 1, that one goes away. 2 times 1 times b. So you're starting to see that this is indeed following the same pattern. So it's the second derivative divided by 2 times 1, or 2 factorial. And a would be a similar process. a would be the third derivative at 1 over 3 factorial. So if I'm going to write this polynomial function, f of x will equal f of 1 plus f prime of 1 over 1 factorial times x minus 1 to the first. And I'm writing that just for the sake of pattern. And then the next one will be the second derivative over 2 factorial times x minus 1 squared. And then finally, the third derivative at 1 over 3 factorial times x minus 1 cubed. And if I plug all of those numbers in, we would get the polynomial. But the purpose of all of this was to show you that no matter what we center the polynomial around, the setup is going to be the exact same as if we were looking at a Maclaurin polynomial. So if we look at the general 
setup for any Taylor polynomial, it's all the same. f of a, a being the center, over 0 factorial, plus f prime of a over 1 factorial, times x minus a to the first, and so on. And look at the general form. It's the nth derivative at a, the center point, over n factorial, and then times x minus a to the n. Everything's just shifted. Now if a is equal to 0 in this polynomial, that one is now considered a Maclaurin. Same idea, we're just shifting the center. So we're moving the graph to the right a little bit and expanding from there, instead of everything being centered around 0. Okay, why don't you try it with an example? Write a Taylor polynomial for sine x centered at x equals pi over 2. Go ahead and take a moment, and when I say a Taylor polynomial, I mean the general term to infinity with the dot, dot, dot. So go. All right, I hope you gave that a shot. What we need to do then is find f of pi over 2. So in our case, since we're looking at sine, this would be the sine of pi over 2. And the sine of pi over 2 is 1. And then f prime of pi over 2. The derivative of sine, of course, is cosine. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. F double prime of pi over 2. Do this as many times as you need to until you see the pattern that starts to emerge. And what I'm starting to notice is that all of the odd powered derivatives, because they're cosine values, are going to go away. And all of the even powered derivatives, because they are signs, that's the sine value, will stay. Uh, derivative of negative sine is positive sine of pi over 2 equals 1. I think that's enough to give me the pattern that I'm looking for. So I would write then this polynomial shifted around pi over 2 is equal to 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial times x minus pi over 2 squared, and then plus 1 over 4 factorial times x minus 2 to the, f or pi over 2 to the fourth. Okay, I can start to see the pattern. This is negative 1. And since the first term is positive, I'm going to make sure I put this to the n, because negative 1 to the 0 power. I notice that 1 is the numerator in all of these. <clears throat> the denominator is the evens. So this would be 2n factorial. And then x minus pi over 2 to the 2n power. Plus dot, dot, dot. You've got to have the dot, dot, dot in both places in order to show that this is the general Taylor polynomial to infinity. All right, we'll do no more, 